I like to have fun. The, tonight's lecture was probably one of the hardest that there is. I, I really uh, put it on myself. The subject itself should be pretty simple, but because there is such misunderstanding, I felt it was necessary to really put pressure on myself to deal with the areas maybe you didn't even think about yourself. But after I leave, there's no way to come back then and say, well, what about this and what about that? And because we are experiencing this around the world, and I attend these peace conferences in different countries, and I've heard a lot of this back and forth, I wanted to share that with you tonight. I hope you'll forgive me for, if I heard anybody's feelings, it wasn't the intention whatsoever. It asks, what's the meaning behind the statement that Muhammad is the last prophet? First of all, the statement. Is there such a statement in Islam? It says in the Quran, in chapter 33, verse 40, I think, is it 40? Does that sound right? 39, 40, 33, 34, 35. I think it's verse 40. But it says that he is the last, the Khatam Ananbiya, which is the plural of Nabi. Khatam is to seal. He's the seal of all the prophets. Then he said about himself, that the prophethood is like a structure or a building and all these prophets are like the bricks in this building like you're looking at right here and then there's this final brick or capstone that fits it all together and he is that he's that last and final brick he also told us that no new religion from Allah is going to come no new revelation and no new prophet that when Jesus comes back he, and we believe that that he's coming back that he's going to be basically saying the same thing as always, to believe in God and follow the commandments. Which, by the way, the Bible, even today in English, still says that Jesus said that, that you have to obey all the commandments. Reference for that one is Matthew 5, 17, 18, and 19. Real clear. You can't even disobey one commandment. But the meaning of last prophet is that there won't be any new dean, no new prophet, but in fact that Jesus, when he comes back, will be following that. There you are. It says, why do some people have the right to punish others? It said, I mentioned whipping, but isn't Allah in charge? Allah describes the answer to that one himself in the Quran when he talks about the fact that there are some people, even that there will be nations that will fight against nations, even there will be killing. He says that. But that's not new. That's in the Old Testament as well. You see it all the time. But it should be that righteous people will be in the proper places to keep justice and equity for everybody. But it's going to happen either way. There will always be problems. Just because, let's say you have a righteous king or a righteous president, that doesn't make the people behave properly, does it? No. People will still do what people do. But the difference would be that if you have a righteous king or president as opposed to a, another corrupt person, then at least the proper people will be punished. Otherwise, it could be a situation where the evil people are rewarded and the good people are punished. You have heard of income tax, right? Yeah. They're okay. That was one of those that slips up on you. You went, whoa, wait a minute. Huh? I got that. They're just asking about our website and some information there. Uh, I don't want to do a big commercial. Let me just real quick tell you. If you go to shareislam.com, you can access our 2,000 websites from there. They're listed there. If you want audios or videos, just go to shareislam.com. Thanks for giving me a chance to stick a commercial in there. And I love you for Allah's sake as well. Implication about secularists, infidels, people who have no faith, are the, that are the real opposition. You rationalize the conflict. I don't know if you meant phrases in... Okay, you're just referring to some of the verses in the Quran. Real quick, let me share with you something. The word infidel is English. The word infidel it was used first against Muslims a thousand years ago during the Crusades. That is how the Pope 
the Pope described Muslims as infidels, said they don't believe in God, and they have to be driven out of the Holy Land, and sent out to Crusaders to assassinate every single one that got in their way. And not only did they kill the Muslims, they killed the Jews, and they killed Christians of other faiths. It's well recorded. This is not me telling you something that's brand new to you. You know that. You can go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Encyclopedia Americana. You can go to the World Book Encyclopedia. You can go to, what is that called, the Carta, something Carta? Online? Encarta. Go to that and just read it for yourself. There's the whole story. Infidel, this is English. It means not true. Because fidelity is talking about being absolutely true. Or honest. Fidelity. Infidel, the opposite. Non-Muslims translated the Quran first to the English language. Muslims later use those as a basis to try to work off of because they're not having English as their first language. I don't have that problem. In fact, my master's is in English. I understand it. I'm still working on the Arabic, but I'm not having a trouble at all with English. The word infidel is inappropriate to be used in translating the Quran and talking about people who are of the book, meaning Jews and Christians. Because infidel does not describe them whatsoever. In fact, the opposite is true in chapter 3, verse 110, because it tells us, Kuntan Khayru Umati no Krajitlin Nasi Tat Maruna Bil Maruf, Watan Hauna Anhil Munkar Watuk Minuna Bila. But then it continues. Now, most of the Muslims know this one. Am I right? How many of you know that verse? Yeah, you know that. Did you know that's not all of it? There's more. You're the best of nations raised up because you call to what is right and righteous and you forbid what is evil and unrighteous and you believe in a law, comma. And if the people of the book had believed, it would have been better from them and from them are those who have iman. They believe in a law. But most of them are fasik. It doesn't say Infidel. It said Fasik. What does Fasik mean? Disobedient. It means they break the commandments. Ask any pastor, preacher, priest, ask them. Do most of the people in your community break the commandments? They go, yeah, that's true, they do. So, duh. What's the problem? The word infidel is inappropriate to be used in reference to these people. It's difficult for me to imagine any of the words to be translated to this from the Quran, except maybe you could use the word that should be pagan or idolater, and then you could substitute that and say infidel. But it doesn't give the right meaning. A pagan and an idolater, you, these are very clear. We know what we're talking about in religion when we use that term. But infidel is subjective. Because that stage, you're saying that one person could call the other person that, and that's exactly what we have. I say you're wrong because I'm right. Oh, really? Well, I think I am right and you're wrong. Oh, okay. That's basically how you use that word. But a pagan shows you exactly what their belief system is. An idolater means they use idols. But a person who's not using anything other than their belief in the one God this is called a monotheist. We consider Christians to be monotheistic. Even though some of them say God is three and one at the same time, it's still basically monotheistic. And that's what Allah calls them in the Quran. Same holds true, of course, for Jews. Monotheistic. So it's inappropriate to use this word to translate the Quran for that. Now, as far as people who have no faith at all, this word that they're translating there is kafir. Kafir comes from kafir, kufr, which means what? Our word in English, cover, is exactly the same word. It means to cover the truth. And nobody is kafir until they know it's been shown to them and then they totally cover it up and deny it. And Allah talks about this throughout the Quran, those who deny the proofs of Allah. 
chapter 55, the whole entire chapter 55, Surah Rahman, almost every other verse says that, which of the favors will you two then deny? That's what he's talking about, to Kadviban. So, when we use this word infidel and throw it around like that, it's very inappropriate. You should go and get a little bit more education and find out what it really says and talk to the scholars that have both languages and better represent that because it's, it's, it really looks nasty. When you, if, you, if you call me that, I'm going to be upset. If I call you that, you're going to be upset. But if I say you don't believe in God and the guy's an atheist, he'll say, that's right, I sure don't. He won't be mad. That's what he believes. And if I say you're an idolater and he likes idols, he'll say you're absolutely right. That's what he does. So try not to use words that taint the picture. That's basically what we're saying. What do we say to people who say hateful things about our religion? Well, I have a whole section about that in one of our websites. Go to, we have a website called Search for Islam. Search for Islam. You have to put all those words together, three words. Search for Islam.com. Type in the word harsh. Type in the word H A R S H. And all of these will come up. And not only will give you the answers to the questions that most people throw out there, hateful questions, but at the same time, it'll show you how to answer it by being nice and polite as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to be. Not like me. Not, don't, don't follow my way. Don't be like somebody from Texas. You ask me a point of view on what's going on in Palestine. I've never been there. I only know people from there. For sure, it's very difficult, and I'm glad I don't live there. But I have no opinion about things that I'm not an expert on or don't spend time with. I, I have no right to answer a question like that. I do pray for the people of Palestine all the time, though, and I ask a lot to make it better for me. Somebody's asking why I went to Islam after being a pastor in another religion. I was a preacher, but that's moot point. Yeah, you're, you're comparing the law and code of conducts in Islam, and you're right. You said it seems to you, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, Islam is called a codified religion, instead of the grace given freely by Jesus. Well, we will we'll, we'll make one little adjustment here. We don't believe that Jesus is the grace, but rather that he called people to the grace. That's what we believe. And we don't believe that Jesus died for our sins, but he told us how to deal with our sins very clearly. And that we didn't need somebody else to die for our sins, that we needed to be responsible ourselves, and we needed to learn how to apologize, and we learned, needed to learn how to ask forgiveness of Allah and not just say, charge it to him. We don't have that concept in Islam, you're right. But as far as saying that we don't have the grace, then you're wrong. Because in Islam, the grace is so beautiful that it begins even at birth. At the moment of birth, Allah's mercy starts. He starts the Quran off, I'm going to give you some reference for some words, and every single chapter, except for one, and then it's mentioned in another uh, inside of chapter, so it's a total of 114 times, Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Rahma and Rahim are from the same root, Rahama. And Rahama is the basis of all the words in Arabic for benevolence, graciousness, um, compassion, mercy, grace. All of the words that we can come up with in English together will not describe this word Rahama. It is powerful. Arham and Rahma and Rahama are all from the same root. How many of you know I was also describing body parts in a woman? Yep, I was. Because Allah said it in the Quran, He used that exact phrase to describe what we call the uterus, which sounds very clinical, but in Arabic it's very beautiful. Because it says that don't break the ties of the womb, but it says arham. And when you're conceived inside of your mother, it's called the place of mercy. That's where you started out in God's mercy, inside of your mother. 
and developed into who you are. You started in mercy. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us that every child is born in a state of Islam already. Every child is born as a Muslim. Doesn't mean it's on their passport, doesn't mean it's their, you know, ethnicity, but it means that they're innocent and they have grace from Allah. Any child that dies, regardless of the belief or disbelief of the parent, goes to paradise. All children, when they die, go to paradise. This is a teaching in Islam. This is the grace. If your religion doesn't teach that, then you need to look at it and wonder about that. Because the common statement of all people on the earth, all society, use the expression innocent as a newborn baby. So if your religion is teaching that people aren't innocent when they're born, then this is in contrast to the common usage of the term. Islam teaches exactly that. It's very merciful. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said that all the babies, all the children are born into the natural fitra or inclination to be in submission to God. But it's their parents that will raise them up to be these different religions or lack of it. Make sense? And in fact, we know that. Anybody that's a psych student knows that's exactly how it goes. As the quote comes from the Bible, so as the tree is bent, so grows the tree. As you bend the twig, that's how the tree grows. And that's how a child is the same way. It's no different. As far as the grace in Islam, look at this. We work all the time trying to please Allah by following the commandments. Christianity calls for the same thing. It's very clear. The Gospels insist that Jesus ordered his followers to obey the commandments. In fact, he says, if you love me, you will love the Father and you will obey the commandments. He even went so far as to say, according to the Bible in English, it says, that he told his followers that he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, which means the Torah, the Old Testament, but he came to fulfill, and not until all things are accomplished shall a single dot, a jot, or an iota be in any wise lessened. And if anybody broke a single commandment, listen to this, anybody breaks one commandment and teaches it, meaning that it's okay to break it, he'll be the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches that, they'll be the highest in the kingdom. That's what it says. It's not what preachers say. I've been around a lot of preachers, a lot more than most of you guys have been around. And I know that they do a lot of talking, but I also know what they do when they're not up there in front of people. And a lot of times we say things, people say things to please the audience. They do that. And a lot of stuff I say maybe won't please the audience, but I didn't come here to please you. I came here to please Allah, and I hope that he'll accept that. You said there's no grace in Islam, or you imply that? Let me share with you this. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, after the prayer one day, he turned to his companions and he said, did you know that nobody will enter paradise except by the grace? And that's the word he used, Rahma of Allah. And they said, even you? He said, even me. But he went further than that. On another occasion, he explained that if a man came on the day of judgment with no bad deeds at all, and a mountain of good deeds, he would be asked, would you like to enter paradise on your good deeds or on the grace, the mercy of God? He said, hey, I don't have any bad deeds. I'll go in on my good deeds, you know? Then they would bring a scale and they would put on one side his good deeds, this mountain of good deeds, and on the other side, the value of one eye, one eye, and it would totally outweigh all of his good deeds. What is one eye? Do this little test with me right now. It's free, by the way. You can do it. Watch. Put your hand over one of your eyes. Do it. Now look around the room. It takes a couple seconds. Now all of a sudden, with your, your hand covering up that one eye, you're going to notice you lose depth perception. You see that? You can't tell how far away something is anymore. You need the other eye to do it. And this, is, one eye is a grace from Almighty Allah, how about both of them? And just one outweighs all the good deeds that you could ever possibly do. Absolutely, there is no doubt in Islam we talk about the grace and the mercy of Allah all the time. We all hope for that.
but we don't count only on that we make some good intention along the way the first saying of Muhammad collected in a number of great works Imam Bukhari Imam Nawawi Al Arba'in the first hadith says in the Amal bin Niyat that for sure all of the actions of the human being are going to be judged and rewarded according to the intention if you had a good intention you already have a good deed even if you didn't accomplish it if you accomplish a good deed you receive 10 rewards for it or 70 or 700 or as much as Allah would like to give you but on the other side if you did a bad deed and you intended to do that bad deed you only have one bad deed and he told us follow it up with a good one to get rid of it but one of the keys in Islam is you have to admit you don't have to go out to the public and tell all your sins no actually you shouldn't do that but you have to admit to yourself I am wrong and that's something that a lot of the people in society today don't want to say they want to justify what they do and rationalize it it's not acceptable in Islam if you're wrong you have to admit it to yourself and to your Lord and ask him to forgive you but if you'll do that then you'll get the grace you'll have the grace and you'll get to go to paradise oh this is a good one to end our program with tonight excellent it said how did our prophet peace be upon him speak to Christians about Islam what kind of tone of voice did he use did he get angry with them if they annoyed him with the things that they said uh, I think maybe you're talking about me now you're right I do get annoyed pretty fast you're right and I blame that partly on being raised up in Texas <laughs> but I am not the example of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him but I will tell you what I read about him I wish I was like him because not only when they insulted him was he patient not even when he said this they said huge disparaging things against him and all he said to them was worship God without partners that will be better for you that's what he said that was his message over and over and over and over and they would say the most horrible things and then they would do more they would physically beat him up once they nearly they nearly beat him and his uh, close associate which is Abu Bakr nearly beat him to death in front of the Kaaba but they still didn't go back and curse him they didn't and on one occasion he went he walked to a place called Ataif which is a healthy walk by the way and when they were in Ataif he went to talk to the leaders there and tell them about this way of life called Islam believing there's only one God and leaving these pagan gods the leaders there were three of them there all should have the respect that Arabs have for any guest who comes but instead they turned him away and they put the street urchins against him with stones and rocks which they threw the stones and rocks on him and his companion until they said that the Prophet ﷺ, his body was bleeding all over and filling his shoes with blood and in this condition the angel came to him and said God is ready now to drop these mountains down on these people all you gotta do is say the word now ask yourself a question if that had happened to you what would your word been hey they stoned me stone them <laughs> revenge is sweet you know turnabout's fair play they did it first those are all the things that pop in my head but look what he said he said no and then he prayed for him and he asked that Allah would guide them and from them would become those who would worship God without partners is that a true story or not 